Good morning. Um, welcome to our session on human rights, uh, existential challenges, and creative solutions. Um, I'm Meg Satterthwaite. I teach here at the law school. I teach the Global Just Justice Clinic, and I'm also a faculty director of the Bernstein Institute and the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. And with that, I'd love to welcome my colleague, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who has recently joined the faculty um, and is now the chair of our Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. And I could not be more pleased to be sharing this space with him and especially to have him at our, in our community and really leading on human rights here at NYU. Thank you, Meg, and welcome everyone. I'm really pleased and honored to be uh, teaching this session with uh, Meg because we both work quite closely on the types of issues that we're going to discuss today, which um, take stock of the many challenges of human rights and global justice, but also instill some sense of hope and uh, in the spirit of developing solutions to those challenges. So what Meg and I thought we would do is um, have me start laying out the challenges and also some of the initial uh, responses that the human rights uh, movement has come up with to those challenges, and then focus on an area of work that I spend a lot of time on these days, uh, which is climate, climate and human rights. How to address uh, the climate emergency based on human rights tools. And so I will try to divide my presentation into uh, two halves, uh, dev devoting equal time to uh, human rights in general, and then climate and human rights more specifically. So I'll do that with the help of a um, few slides here. I hope that you all can see it. So I'll start with the challenges. And, and I imagine that this is all uh, painfully familiar to all of us. So I won't spend too much time uh, going over the challenges. But I do want to say that uh, people like Meg and I, who spend a lot of time both doing research and working on the ground uh, with human rights uh, activists and organizations, we're painfully aware of how uh, these challenges and the simultaneity and gravity of these challenges have impacted the, the possibility of uh, promoting and protecting human rights. Um, there is a sense of uncertainty. There is a sense, I wouldn't say despair, but certainly uh, existential anxiety about uh, everything from, of course, uh, the war in Ukraine to uh, uh, climate, uh, climate emergency to democratic backsliding. And it is the convergence of all of these challenges and others uh, uh, at the same time that makes for a particularly formidable challenge to the promotion of human rights around the world. And by the way, I'm going to, and we both work in internationally, so we're going to take examples and make a, uh, allusions to uh, practice and research going on around the world. So in terms of the challenges very quickly, uh, I, I would like to highlight four big external challenges to human rights. One is of course, democratic backsliding. And this is just because we have very little time, just a sample of the strong men, they're all men, uh, they, there are more. I run out of space, unfortunately, to, uh, to incorporate all of the, um, leaders of uh, uh, what some political scientists call elected autocracies, from Bolsonaro on the top to Narendra Modi on the left to Viktor Orban in Hungary, who just got reelected, and so on and so forth. You probably re uh, um, recognize these uh, faces. And what's important to know is that they, uh, these and other governments and, and, and movements have um, severely uh, narrowed down the spaces for the operation of civil uh, of human rights organizations around the world. Here at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, we find ourselves uh, hosting and uh, working in solidarity, for example, with colleagues who have had to flee countries like Venezuela or India uh, uh, that uh, found out that they could no longer continue to work uh, in their own countries, despite the fact that they would have, of course, preferred to stay there and uh, with their colleagues and in, in, in tough times. So this is definitely a, a, a huge challenge. Second one, the climate and environmental emergencies. I won't say much at this point about them because uh, I'll spend uh, uh, the second half of my presentation on them. But this is uh, uh, an image that some of you may have seen from 2019. The, uh, 
fires in the Brazilian Amazon um, that kind of brought to the world's attention the fact that uh, key ecosystems like the Amazon or other uh, old growth forests, uh, but also the California forests and you know the Australian coastal areas, uh, that climate is here with us now. Um, and the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report um, uh, from 2018, unequivocally said, well, what we had predicted would happen, you know, halfway uh, into the 21st century is happening now. So uh, this is a challenge for many, but certainly for the protection and for the reality of uh, rights, a whole range of rights, from the right to life, to the right to physical integrity, to uh, the right uh, to housing and many others. Then inequality. At the same time that we've seen uh, the climate emergency and environmental destruction, pollution, and biodiversity loss uh, worsen, uh, basically over the last three decades, the same decades uh, in which we as humanity have known that we've, uh, we've been uh, damaging the climate system and we have done very little uh, about it. Uh, we've seen an increase in socioeconomic inequality around the world. This is a, an image from Sao Paulo, Brazil, but it could have been taken in many uh, regions and countries of the world, and even in the global north, in, the, in, in, in wealthy countries. As we all know, disparities, socioeconomic disparities across class, race, ethnicity, national origin have been on the rise. Um, and finally, the fourth challenge that I would like to highlight is that, um, of course, the information ecosystem and technologies that um, could have a very and, and do have uh, uh, positive impacts on people's lives have also been uh, immensely disruptive and, and harmful. For, for example, the uh, the possibility of a democratic polity to uh, function properly because of misinformation, because of fake news, because of polarization and 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 hate speech being circulated uh, freely through uh, platforms of all kinds. So it is the convergence again of all these challenges that I would like to kind of live with you as the key challenge. If, if, uh, if human rights actors, if human rights organizations, youth movements, indigenous people's organizations, uh, black communities in Southern US or in Latin America, if they were facing any of these challenges, um, one, one of these challenges would be enough uh, to put in, in danger the project of human dignity and human rights and even life on earth uh, in the case of climate. Uh, but it is the simultaneity uh, and the, the acceleration of these trends that make for a pretty volatile and challenging uh, context that uh, we at the center and, and of course many, many organizations and individuals around the world are trying to address. Uh, before I move on to responses, I want to uh, pause for a moment and Comment about the comment on the responses on the on the on the readings on the readings of this moment and on the interpretations of this moment, and um, you may have seen the readings and if you if you spend some time uh, reading the academic uh, and, and the activist uh, debate about this context, well there are very different readings of what's going on and <clears throat> I'll just uh, highlight four possible readings. It looks like today is the day for four uh, item lists. Uh, so the first one is uh, the end times reading, according to which these challenges are so formidable that this is really the end of the human rights project. And this is an, ad, this is a, 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 an argument being advanced by some uh, academics. I haven't seen many practitioners who are steeped in practice, who know what uh, it feels like to do human rights uh, work on the ground. Um, uh, advancing this view. I mean, when you're a practitioner and trying to uh, save people's lives, you, you can't afford to say that this is the end times of human rights. Uh, but certainly it's been an, an influential and provocative argument uh, uh, that's uh, there in the literature. Second one is the complete opposite, meaning that you know some activists and practitioners and some leading organizations uh, at the international level have reacted by doubling down on the status quo on the way in which human rights have been practiced for many decades now. Uh, depending on how you count human rights is a seven decade or five decade project in terms of a legal infrastructure. So the UN Declaration of Human Rights is back to the late 1940s. 
the, the main uh, treaties, the civil and political rights and the socioeconomic rights treaties date back to the late 1960s. But regardless of where you kind of put the, 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 the uh, place the, 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 the marker for the beginning of the contemporary international uh, um, legal regime of human rights, we could, I think we can agree that it's been a relatively successful effort at coming up with, with, a, with a consensus uh, around the world on certain values and certain norms that uh, countries and uh, governmental and non-governmental actors more recently are supposed to abide by. So because of the success of that uh, framework, some more traditional organizations have said, well, this is all of these crises. This is just a temporary phenomenon. Really, there are glitches in a longer term, longer term trend that points in the direction of, uh, of, uh, of, of justice. You know, the, bend, uh, it, the, the arc of history is bending still towards justice and, and these trends of democratic backsliding and others will pass. Uh, and they've continued to do the traditional work that they have done. Then, and this is where I, at least I personally, but I feel that you know, the work that we do here at the center and the clinics tend to be somewhere in between, acknowledging that these are certainly new times, that the simultaneity and the nature and the scale of the challenges that we're uh, facing in, in doing human rights work, they're all quite different from the, those of the 1970s or the late 1940s. Uh, so there's need to update the, the legal uh, toolkit, legal strategies, how to do litigation, how to work with uh, partners, how to, how to represent clients. Uh, and that entails doing reflexive reconstruction, right? So not throwing the baby with the bathwater and still continuing to innovate. And finally, the, the reading that I tend to prefer is a bit more disruptive. Uh, which is that you know, there's no time for gradual reflexive reconstruction. All of this, by the way, of course, I'm, I'm singling these out for pedagogical purposes as uh, mutually exclusive, but in practice, you can combine many of these readings and approaches. But uh, the final one, constructive disruption, uh, says that because we're running, really running out of time, we need, for example, to have uh, carbon emissions by 2030, if we are to have a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, which is what all scientists recommend and advise us to do if we we're to avoid the most catastrophic scenarios of climate change, then we need to attempt more urgent strategies. And this is what I'm going to exemplify, just illustrate with the types of innovative litigation that's happening around the world on climate. So I'm moving now from challenges to readings of those challenges to responses. And um, this is uh, coming out of a, a project that, uh, uh, that we do both at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice uh, and the clinics that I lead here, uh, Future of Human Rights and, and the Earth Rights Advocacy Clinic, uh, looking at the universe of lawsuits that have been filed before national, regional, and uh, international courts uh, to, to prompt and to nudge and to, uh, and to urge um, governments and corporations to do much more about the climate emergency. And many of those lawsuits uh, are filed on behalf of young people, hence the, the image here, which is the uh, cover image for a book that will be publishing soon. Uh, and this is the, the project that I was alluding to, the Climate Litigation Accelerator that's doing this research and accompanying and supporting many of these uh, legal actions. Very quickly, um, I won't go into details. I just want you to see the trend and the details of all these cases are uh, available in the in the paper that was circulated and also in CLX's uh, uh, online resources. But the trend here, as you can tell, and this is just, this does not include all of the cases from 2021. We're finishing the uh, updating of the uh, the 2021 cases, and certainly this bar will be a lot higher than the 2020 uh, bar. And as you see, this is a recent and 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 uh, upward trend. Um, 
in 20, this is the original case filed before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights on behalf of the Inuit people against the US government for not only not doing enough against climate change, but also actively promoting fossil fuel extraction, which uh, as we all know now, uh, 15 years, 20, 17 years later, uh, is one of the types of activities that we need to phase out very quickly if we're to remain under uh, 1.5 degrees of global warming. Um, so the trends here, we've analyzed uh, the universe of cases around 200 at this point, um, and most of them have been filed between 2015 and 2022. Uh, it's not coincidence that the uh, trend picks upward in 2015 because that's when the Paris Agreement was signed, and then that gave uh, lawyers uh, around the world a global framework. It's a non-binding framework, but yet it's still a framework that um, sets a goal. Again, keeping global temperatures beyond below 1.5 degrees of warming, uh, and also uh, that was the point in which lawyers uh, around the world began mobilizing that normative infrastructure and the recommendations of the IPCC to try to translate those lofty um, commitments and, and speeches in Paris and elsewhere last year in Glasgow into binding norms and rules uh, through litigation before domestic courts. So that's what the litigation of climate human rights is uh, all about. Again, won't go into the details here, but you can see the breakdown. Europe has been a key site of, of, of many of these uh, cases um, because of the combination of strong human rights protection, uh, the existence of the European Court of Human Rights that's now considering two key cases, major cases, one against Switzerland and another one against uh, 33 governments uh, filed by, by uh, victims of climate change. And the global north, Latin America, Asia Pacific, Africa is growing in terms of uh, its participation in uh, climate litigation based on human rights arguments. Uh, and finally, and this is an interesting one, uh, you would have found that because this is really a recent phenomenon, really a recent trend, we're talking about five, seven years uh, maximum, that the that courts would have been a lot more uh, a lot more timid in embracing and, and, and accepting the, um, the arguments being put forth by plaintiffs, because many of these cases uh, are uh, of a quite different nature from conventional environmental cases. And yet what you see when you look at those filings, uh, at those cases that have uh, already, that have ended with a definitive ruling, the breakdown of um, rulings for plaintiffs and for governments is pretty even. So, um, and courts, are now learning from each other. There's a lot of cross-fertilization, cross-learning. And I would anticipate that um, uh, as the climate emergency gets even more urgent, uh, courts will be even more willing to um, prompt uh, governments and increasingly corporations uh, to adjust their policies and business models to what science uh, says we need to do in order to avoid catastrophic climate events. Um, and finally, uh, quickly here, I don't have uh, time to go into details of the of the cases, but I'll just you know, I wanted to offer you at least a visual um, uh, pastiche here of some of the cases. Happy to comment on any of them in the Q and A. This is a case in the Netherlands, successful case uh, litigated by Urgenda, a great organization against the Dutch government that ended with a. 2019 court ruling, uh, ruling by the um, Dutch Supreme Court mandating the Dutch government to increase the ambition of its climate uh, emission uh, plan to align, uh, align that plan with the goals of the Paris Agreement and uh, the recommendations of the IPCC of scientists. Then this is a case uh, in, in Colombia that I had the privilege to uh, be part of representing young people who sued, successfully sued the Colombian government to uh, prompt it to uh, deliver on its promise to cut down deforestation in the Amazon uh, region. Uh, uh, just a, a more recent case, and just to give you a flavor for the, of course, this, there are mixed results. Not all the, all the cases end in, in favorable decisions for the plaintiffs. Um, this is a case in which uh, also an outstanding organization in the UK uh, challenged the construction of a third runway in the Heathrow airport. Um, and uh, you know, the lower court uh, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, then the 
uh, higher court reversed uh, that ruling. And, uh, and the, the question here is whether um, expanding airport uh, capacity at a time when air travel is, has been documented once and again as being one of the major sources of, 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 climate, of carbon emissions, whether that's compatible with a, a government's commitment uh, to the Paris uh, Agreement. So in this case, if the Heathrow uh, additional runway goes forward, uh, that additional, uh, the, you know, the considerable additional emissions associated with the uh, air traffic that that would make possible would uh, put directly in peril the possibility of the UK uh, delivering on its, uh, uh, on its promise to cut down emissions by a certain uh, level uh, by 2030 and 2050. Uh, more recent cases, if, if you have to choose one case and one court ruling, I would recommend you look at this one. This is from last year, the Neubauer versus Germany case uh, decided by the Constitutional Court of Germany. Um, as some of you may know, probably the most uh, prestigious constitutional court uh, in, in the world. And uh, it, this is the plaintiff, uh, a member of the Fridays for Future movement, Lisa Neubauer. Uh, challenge successfully challenged, uh, of course, with the uh, uh, advice of very good lawyers, uh, challenged the German government's plans to cut down emissions. As uh, Germany, by the way, has a pretty robust uh, climate policy, but the uh, the plaintiffs and then the court found out that by not being specific enough, detailed enough about what about the how about the how how the government planned to get to the uh, climate emission target that the, um, the, the policy was, uh, um, was unconstitutional in that particular regard. So it mandated that the government provide details all the way up to 2050. So what sources of emissions, so how, what's being phased out? Um, and uh, in Germany, all of the parties responded pretty positively to this um, uh, ruling and now there's a new climate plan. And then finally, in terms of you know, very <laughs> recent update, these are cases uh, pending before the Brazilian Supreme Court. This is Justice Barroso, the presiding judge in one of the four key cases challenging the uh, disastrous record of the Bolsonaro government in um, controlling uh, deforestation in the Amazon region. This is, uh, the hearing was very recent and uh, it was, took place a couple of weeks ago and the rulings uh, should uh, come down at any time now. Um, I'm gonna end with a few takeaways in terms of the legal developments uh, that uh, one can extract uh, from these cases and from the whole trend towards um, using human rights arguments to advance climate action. Of course, I want to be careful here because this is a recent trend. So courts and plaintiffs and everyone is still learning. Uh, I, of course, I'm happy to comment on a bit on, on, the, on, uh, on climate litigation in the US, although I've left it out almost completely because uh, uh, human rights litigation, as uh, Meg knows way better than I do in the US is uh, particularly challenging using human rights arguments in, in the US, especially from international human rights law. So most of the cases, the climate cases in the US have been litigated on other grounds, you know, torts, um, nuisance and, 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 uh, and, and other um, common law grounds um, as opposed to international human rights law. But in this, trend that I've uh, illustrated briefly in, the, uh, in this presentation, we can already see some emerging norms. One is that there is increasing willing by, uh, uh, there's, there's, an, there's an increasing will by uh, in domestic, regional, uh, and some UN quasi-judicial bodies like the UN Human Rights Committee uh, to accept that the right to a healthy environment, which by the way, is on its way to be uh, formally recognized uh, as a new right by the UN uh, General Assembly this year, that that extends that that right extends to uh, climate action, that human beings uh, uh, have a right to demand that governments and increasingly corporations, I won't have time, I won't have to comment on a few very interesting cases against um, uh, corporations like Shell, but I'm happy to elaborate on them 
uh, in the Q and A, that that human beings can go to court to enforce uh, legally binding uh, standards, right standards that according that would lead governments to increase their ambition in terms of uh, carbon emission reduction, adapting to climate change, um, and other forms of climate policies uh, in the in the short term. Then I already kind of anticipated this one. Virtually all of the courts that uh, have uh, uh, ruled on these cases have said that government's discretion is not, uh, the government discretion on climate policy is limited, right? Many of them have been quite deferential. For example, a well-known Irish case ended up in um, a, fav uh, a favorable ruling for the government uh, on, the, on, on the, you know, on the, on the argument that uh, this is mostly a political issue, a, a policy issue, not a political issue, and that governments have, you know, wide latitude discretion to decide on exactly what they do against climate change. But even relative differential courts have said that that latitude is not endless, that uh, policies uh, need to be uh, reasonable, that they need to be based on evidence, on science, and that courts are the ones in, in, demo, in democratic uh, checks and balances systems to review the, rational, the rationality of those courts and of those standards and policy. And finally, um, this one I already uh, alluded to, what this series of uh, lawsuits around the world are doing is basically domesticating, bringing down to the domestic level, the scientific and legal consensus, making it binding at the, uh, at the uh, domestic level. And finally, um, a frequent counter argument that's advanced by um, the uh, defendants in many of these cases is that you know, no, no individual country or no individual corporation, even if it's a fossil fuel uh, company, uh, is responsible for climate change, that this is a huge global um, collective action problem, and that uh, no government uh, should be uh, singled out as being responsible to do something uh, specific because unless everyone else puts their act together, then that the, what the country, that particular country or that particular corporation does, doesn't really solve the problem. And, uh, and everyone from the Netherlands to Shell have said that in responding to uh, plaintiffs. And what many courts have said in return is, well, look, the, this, the logic of human rights and the logic of international lawmaking is quite different. So they flipped this consequentialist argument on its head and have said, well, unless each actor, each government, each corporation that contributes its quote unquote fair share to global action, there will not be any chance for trust among governments, about, about, uh, uh, among economic actors that everyone will do their best effort to do what they have to do against climate change. So uh, that's that counter argument has not succeeded in many of these cases. And what's instead kind of arising as a, as a, as a norm is the idea that everyone needs to contribute their fair share. I'll stop there. And uh, of course, be happy to take questions, comments uh, after uh, Max's presentation. So I'm going to be um, in many ways picking up from where Cesar left off. Um, oops. I'll be talking a little bit about some research that I've done um, and also uh, relating that to what the Global Justice Clinic is doing right now. So taking kind of as a start what Cesar was talking about that there are really these existential challenges to international human rights work how do we kind of move beyond that sort of brokenness and, and start to embrace solidarity with movements? And so I'll be talking about the brokenness and then the solidarity piece. Um, so Cesar already said this, you know, the enormity of the human rights problem today is incredible. Um, everything from ecological destruction, climate crisis, war and, um, you know, overt uh, conflict, and then also just simply repression, um, people not being able to obtain basic rights, basic um, things that they need. And I think a lot of this is summed up in the fact that um, around the world, there's an estimated 5 
uh, sorry, 4 billion people who live outside the protection of the law. So in circumstances where they cannot call on the law to protect their rights, it's an incredible, huge existential problem. So what do we know about our old human rights tools? I think the first thing we know is that they're insufficient to face these challenges, um, that reports uh, naming and shaming as, as often is called uh, the old traditional human rights toolbox, those can be extremely important. And, and I think they're really important in specific moments. They can advance reform. And forensic investigations like the kind we see right now, I think in Ukraine concerning uh, Russia's war crimes and crimes against humanity, those are crucially important um, and they can help families, communities obtain some sense of closure but we also know that those are insufficient and we need better methods. Um, we need methods that will help us prevent human rights violations and start to really alter the basic conditions of people who live outside the protection of the law. There's something else we know though, is that our human rights tools involve trauma exposure. And I think this is gonna be very obvious, um, but interestingly, this issue really hadn't been researched um, systematically until recently. So in 2015, uh, some colleagues and I did a, a survey with hundreds of human rights advocates and just tried to get a sense of what kind of trauma exposure were they experiencing in their human rights work. This is just a bit of a summary. Um, about 34% said that they directly witnessed trauma concerning others. So they might be witnessing things like kidnappings or um, torture, et cetera. About 89% said that they indirectly were exposed to trauma. And of course this would involve interviewing survivors, talking to clients about their experiences, investigating crimes, um, investigating human rights violations. And then you can't unfortunately see the number there. Sorry about that. But it's about 20% who said they were themselves direct victims of violence, detention, or threats at the hands of states or organized non-state actors. So in other words, you have people who are working to advance rights also being attacked for their, their work to advance those rights. So then we wanted to ask, you know, how is this showing up in people's lives? How is it impacting them if they're exposed to this kind of trauma? And there were some really upsetting findings here. Um, the first was that about 19% of our survey participants had full-blown um, post-traumatic stress disorder criteria. So of course we can't diagnose a person through a survey, but this would show that at least prima facie, they probably have um, PTSD. And we found 19% also had a, a number of the symptoms of PTSD, but not the full-blown form. So if you take those together, that's 40% of the human rights advocates that we surveyed. And just to put that in context, the 19% is higher than what has been found in combat veterans. So there's something going on here with the way that we are doing human rights work, which of course inherently involves um, being exposed to trauma. That's what the work is about. But the question is, is there some way of working through that that won't reduplicate harm in, this, in the um, form of PTSD, depression? You see the burnout number is very high as well. Um, and how can we kind of increase this 43% of folks who showed, um, who showed resilience? So we, we next did a study that, where we looked at what were human rights advocates saying about these things and how they're showing up inside human rights movements and organizations. And so we did hundreds of um, organizational surveys and interviews. And this is sort of what advocates said about the causes of stress and trauma within their work. So some of these I think are extremely obvious, including direct trauma exposure and vicarious trauma, which I was just talking about. But it also includes things like poor management, uh, precarious conditions, you know, where, where people aren't paid a living wage to do their human rights work. Um, and then discrimination and bias, which is showing up inside human rights organizations, inside human rights movements. Um, that has a huge impact on people's um, experience of the work. And then something that I'll come back to, perceived inefficacy. So that feeling that the work is so challenging and that what we're doing is too small to have an effect. So we can't see that our work is effective, it starts to really overwhelm people. And I have some quotes in these slides from advocates that we interviewed, um, just so you can get a little bit more of the flavor of what um, 
folks are saying about their experience. We then asked, okay, if, if these are kind of um, the sources of stress inside your organizations, what are the impacts that you're seeing showing up in an organizational, at an organizational level? So um, I think the most obvious again is anxiety, PTSD, depression, and unfortunately suicide. There were a number of very high profile suicides at Amnesty International a few years ago, just as one example. Um, but then also things like isolation and withdrawal. So people feeling like they can't talk about their work to their family or they can't, um, they can't interact with people in, in the way that they used to because of the impact of the work. Conflict with colleagues, we know well from um, studies in psychology that when people are experiencing severe impacts of, um, of trauma and vicarious trauma, that often creates conflicts within organizations. It might have family life impacts. Um, we talked to human rights defenders who just talked about how they feel guilty that their work is bringing danger not only to them, but also to their family sometimes when they're targeted. Physical ailments, of course, substance abuse, um, et cetera. And then demotivation, um, compassion, fatigue, and burnout again. And people really talked about this sense of taking in like this, this example from the Central African Republic um, of hearing constantly these stories, taking it in and not being able to really metabolize it, not having a space for it, it to go. Um, so we next, next asked about challenges to advancing well-being. Again, given that these are the, the things that are impacting us, the sources of those, um, of those harms, and then what are the challenges to advancing them within organizations? One of the things that people talked about a lot was individual beliefs and what they called a human rights culture. And some people actually called it a cowboy culture or a martyr culture, the sense that you have to overwork yourself. You have to work constantly in order to be a moral person. Um, and that sense of, of being between that rock of having to work all the time in the hard place of burning out and being ineffective. There's also um, just basic lack of psychological support or mental health programming and even just psychoeducation um, and, and helping prepare folks for the field. The idea of putting self-care on individuals and not addressing it at an organizational or movement level was also um, something that folks brought up a lot. And then of course, limited funding um, and not having enough money and resources to do the work. Poor management comes up a lot and so does this sense of organizations having to compete with each other in this marketplace of human rights in order to get funding, in order to get basic resources. So we've thought a lot here about how do you think about burnout at this level and how can we help prepare students for this field where they wanna go in, you know, do this work for a lifetime and they want to have um, a full life and they don't wanna burn out. So one of the things that, that has been really helpful is kind of reframing this concept of burnout. Um, and I love this quote from Vicki Reynolds because it says, you know, burnout is not about the work itself. It's about being unable to change the unjust structures that we're working within. And so recognizing that can already start to, to change the, the framing of what people are experiencing in human rights right now. Another um, concept that is helpful, I think, is the concept of moral injury. So at first I resisted this concept's relevance. My psychology friends were saying like, I really think there's moral injury here in the human rights setting. And I thought that I'm not sure about that. Um, I thought of it as a concept that was about um, people who maybe were in a situation where they had to um, they had to actually be a perpetrator of human rights violations. They had to do something that was against their, their um, basic beliefs. But I realized then that I was resisting this for a reason, which is I really think it, it, it is an issue in human rights. Um, and so a couple of ways of thinking about it that's helpful. First, it, it does develop following involvement in activities that abruptly or severely transgress deeply held moral beliefs or deeply held expectations. And so in the human rights setting, if you're finding that the work you're doing is not changing the structures um, that you're trying to change and that the work you're doing can't prevent human rights violations, that starts to have an impact on how you view um, yourself. And you start to feel that um, you might be participating in something that's not helpful. And this, 
this concept of a lack of meaning when things start to, to really um, shift in a worldview such that you can't find meaning in the things that you used to do, including um, here, I think we've seen that with a lot of human rights um, activists and advocates and lawyers finding um, that they start to, to, to experience this sense of moral injury. So we went back and we um, did some additional um, investigation into the data that we collected. And we found actually, interestingly enough, that moral injury is associated with PTSD severity. And then also again, with this low sense of self-efficacy. And I think this is especially important for people like Cesar and I who are teaching law students, it's also associated with perfectionism. So uh, trying to find ways to let go of these things, of these ways of framing things, feels really, really important um, and, and like a helpful insight. So another concept that has been really helpful in coming out of our data as we talk to human rights activists is this idea that activism both can be harmful because it involves this trauma exposure, but then it's also healing. So there is a way to transform it into a healing justice or a healing solidarity. And healing justice is a, a framework and a concept that um, comes out of black feminism in the US. And it's been very resonant and helpful in our, in our work on these issues. And then this idea of healing solidarity that it's really enjoining with communities who are leading their own um, human rights struggles that you start to make these true, these true connections and you can transform um, some of these problems of moral injury. So one of the things that we use in the Global Justice Clinic um, and the Bernstein Institute in particular um, for advancing human rights is this idea of critical legal empowerment. And it's really about solidarity in action um, and so I'm going to give you a brief case study just to give you more of a sense of what it is. Um, so these photos are from the South Rupununi District Council, which is one of the partner organizations that the clinic has. It's in um, Southern Guyana, right at the border of um, Brazil. And so the, the ancestral territory of the Wapichan people is governed by this district council. And this district council has been taking a very active role in defending their ancestral territory, which is some savanna, and then it's also the beginning, um, the edges of rainforest as well. So what the heck is critical legal empowerment? So what I would, would, would call it is really this solidarity in action. Um, and it's about, as Vivek Maru has said, he has a wonderful TED talk, which I, um, credited down here, take a, take a look at it if, you, if you'd like. Uh, but he talks about communities knowing, using, and shaping law. So having critical consciousness of yourself as a rights holder, being able to articulate your rights and knowing that um, what is happening to you is an injustice, and then using the law to enforce your rights. So engaging with the systems that should be protecting your rights, that's a big piece of it. And then shaping law wherever there are exclusionary forces in the law, where the law hasn't become sufficiently effective to make those rights real. And then the critical piece is something um, that we've been adding, which is about transforming the law. So really looking at legal systems that have been systemically formed with injustice baked in. So in the US, of course, this would include looking really to dismantle um, any forms of racial discrimination that were baked into our system. Um, and in this case study I'm going to be giving you, it's about transforming um, customary law that this indigenous community has into actual concrete black letter law that will ensure that their rights are protected. So um, as you can see, this is um, a map of Guyana all the way there on the left. And the, this, the place that I'm talking about is in that yellow region called Upper, upper Tafakatu, um, Upper Essequibo. And that's District 9 for any of you who know Guyana. And then you can see on the middle map, this is um, the territorial map that the SRDC has been using. Um, they have title, so this is the entire ancestral territory. They have title over the shaded areas, the blue shaded areas, and they're seeking title over their um, whole ancestral territory. And then as you'll see, those more geometrically regular shapes are mining licenses that they have not had any right to reject or accept. Um, they have simply been given by the government within their ancestral territories. So one of the big um, 
things that the Wapichan community is doing is really educating themselves about how can they use the law to be able to exercise um, really stewardship over this land on which they've lived for, for generations upon generations. And so on the right here, you have um, a women's empowerment um, workshop where they're learning about how human rights advance um, the rights of their community. So I'm not gonna go into all of this, but the, the point here is really about knowing and transforming law. So as many of you no doubt know, historical doctrines of international law have not been helpful for indigenous rights. Um, they've actually been actors in the dispossession of, um, of indigenous peoples. But over time through indigenous um, advocacy, things have transformed a great deal. And they've used actually the international human rights system, the international, um, international law system more broadly at the UN and other regional systems to transform that law into something that's actually quite uh, protective and, and, and um, and very concretely so. So what is the focus now for the SRDC is really taking these human rights based um, successes and transforming them into rights on the ground. So the right to have their land demarcated and titled to them as the, as the most strong example. And then of course the right to say, oh, to have uh, self-determination over that space, including over activities that are taking place on it. So what do they do to use the law in these spaces? Um, I'm not gonna go into great detail here because I don't have a lot of time, but just to explain, they've actually created a couple of drones that they now use to uh, monitor for um, illegal activities on their land. And then they use the data that they collect. They also have monitors who go out into the field, use GPS, collect data, and we help them also integrate water testing. So they're testing the water in these areas that mining is happening. Um, and then they use that data to advance um, their rights. And so this, these are just a couple examples on the right here, upper hand, um, that is one of their, it's actually near a sacred mountain um, and that's some of the mining that's happening. And so you can see that just you know, this beautiful lush forested space is being um, turned into uh, a mud pit there. And um, down at the bottom, I just wanted to give you a sense of kind of the, the clinics work. So these are students um, working with the community and, and in the middle there, you have two of the monitors who are learning to use um, water monitoring um, equipment, which they've now started to use in their, in their territories. So this is um, to explain, you know, the, the collection of the data leads to then advocacy, including at the UN, but also domestically and that has led to some, some really concrete um, successes. And the role of the clinic has been to essentially backstop that to help um, with the human, rights, um, the, the human rights education or the human rights capacity building. And then also to backstop in deciding on strategies for advocacy um, to help with um, things like, as I already said, the water monitoring and scientific expertise. So um, I think something to help <laughs> to help with a low self-efficacy is um, the sense of actually having results. So the SRDC has um, had some really strong and impressive results from the work they've been doing. So in 2018, they put out this um, environmental monitoring report where they advanced their human rights-based argument that they um, need to have title to their ancestral territories in order to protect it and showing the activities that were occurring on their territories um, that were both violating Guyanese law and also violating their human rights. Um, they then uh, shared this information with the um, CERD committee, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination on the basis of race. Um, and this is a UN committee that monitors the CERD convention. And the CERD committee has been very helpful in telling the government of Guyana that it must, um, pro it must protect indigenous rights and recognize their rights. Um, they actually had on the upper left corner here, the former president came to their community to discuss the illegal mining that was going on and to try to come to understanding and agreements around their right to have decision-making and to have consultation over that. Um, the, the struggle is continuing. And this year we had students working with um, numerous initiatives within the community to continue to advance um, advance these rights. 
And then just to leave on a positive note, um, this is one of our partners in Haiti. Um, this is James Ulrich Pierre, who's with the Collective Justice Mean. And he had this wonderful observation that you can't defend human rights when you're above people, but you've got to be in this horizontal space where people themselves have information, they consider it, they determine a course of action. And then of course, as lawyers, as law students, we bring certain tools to bear and we can join together to do the work. And, I, and to, to conclude, that sense of being effective in solidarity and taking concrete steps with a community that you're genuinely connected to is a real um, concrete way of fighting burnout, of advancing a sense of self-efficacy and of doing so um, really in solidarity with communities. So I think what we'll do now is um, We'd love to open to any questions and answers, uh, any questions you might have, and we'll attempt to answer them. And I'd love to invite Cesar back onto the onto the screen. Um, Cesar, I see there's a question here that I think is one for you. Is there, I'll just read it out so everyone has it. Is there a danger of defining human rights too broadly to include climate change, which through a huge, though a, a huge existential problem has not traditionally been viewed as a human rights issue and may result in a lack of focus on what have traditionally been viewed as human rights issues. Also defining it too narrowly as many US human rights advocates do to exclude economic inequality and similar issues. What's the right way to define its proper domain and focus? That's a great and difficult question, uh, but I'll take a stab at it. So it, it, there, is no, there is no consensus about what the sweet spot is, uh, but uh, there are some ideas coming from practice, uh, from uh, strategy litigation, also from research that uh, address some of the uh, risks that um, uh, are being uh, put on the table by the question. So on the on the under inclusiveness uh, side, it, certainly the U.S. is exceptional, and also other countries like Australia are pretty exceptional in uh, taking on, like, assuming and, and adopting, embracing a very very narrow understanding of, of human rights and a very kind of uh, introverted uh, understanding of human rights that looks inward as opposed to international legal developments. Uh, so. For the rest of the world of the international human rights community, and not just activists, but also governments, for example, the fact that the US has failed to embrace kind of the second wave, the late 1960s um, a wave of rights uh, on socioeconomic rights, the right to health, right to education, which, by the way, do not mean, uh, do not mandate a specific form of providing those goods and services, right? There's, there's leeway in terms of the how, but, but the, the widespread consensus is that just as uh, humanity accepted that uh, freedom of expression or freedom of assembly or freedom of religious, uh, uh, freedom of religion uh, are key constituents of what a dignified life is, then also having access to uh, a vaccine, uh, having access to quality primary and secondary education, that all of that in the 21st century, certainly even in the 20th century, were uh, aspirations that should be incorporated into uh, human rights instruments. Then the question is now moving on to the environment and, and, and climate. Of course, back in the 1950s, 19, uh, 1940s, 1970s, uh, the idea that uh, there were limits to growth, the, the idea that while, uh, as we try to protect individual and socioeconomic rights, we were also uh, wreaking havoc with the planet, that was not there. So the, the, the omission on the environmental rights is more a product of history. So I personally see, and the more UN uh, human rights bodies like the UN Human Rights Council, which last year adopted a resolution acknowledging the international right to a healthy environment, but the, what I see those, developments doing is basically updating the human rights infrastructure to what we know, uh, to the world that we live in, which still leaves the question that I don't have uh, time to, to, to answer, well, what are the limits? And what I would suggest is that uh, um, Daniel or anyone who may be interested, take a look at a great paper written by a colleague of ours, Philip Austin, on uh, I can't remember what the exact title is, but it's all about the quality control that needs to be 
uh, applied when considering new human rights claims because there should be limits because otherwise uh, anything and everything could be um, um, uh, uh, kind of a, a defended or advanced in terms of human rights language and the outcome of that would be that you know the 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 claims would make no sense anymore because if everything can be a, a, a human right then nothing really counts uh, meaningfully as a human right thanks so much Cesar. um i think we don't have any other oh here comes a question okay how should the legal academy create incentives for students to go into human rights work can something be done on campus recruitment yes scholarships required courses so Absolutely. Um, I think the the main obstacle I'll just say that Cesar and I see on a on a yearly basis at the end of the year is students having a pipeline into the field. There's a lot of interest, and so you know, being able to fund fellowships, for example, is incredibly important so that they can get that foot in, that they can start doing the work. Um, and we're really working closely by mentoring students along the way and ensuring that they have pathways um, to the work. And Cesar, I don't know if you want to add to that as well. Uh, I fully agree. I practiced the uh, law and uh, and also taught in other countries. And what I see coming kind of as an outsider to the uh, U.S. law school system is that the missing piece is right there. As students leave, they graduate, and then look for opportunities. And there's not enough opportunities. There's so much uh, interest, and we have we're in the privileged position of being able to choose from literally dozens of talented students that we can only take around what I would say less than 20% of students to, to our clinics. And then even the students who do uh, take our clinics will feel pressure to, of course, to go to other lines of practice because of uh, economic constraints, also pro professional constraints. So we're keen to beef up the offerings that, that crucial, I would say like the crucial two years right after law school, when if they're getting hooked into human rights practice in a in a meaningful and interesting way, I my hope is that more and more talented, committed, highly passionate students will be able to uh, choose their uh, human rights careers that they would like to, to live in. Thanks so much. And I think we're just right at the close. It's, it's really been a true pleasure and a privilege to be here with you all this morning. Um, and we look forward to maintaining contact with you. Please feel free to email us. Um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your reunion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, May.